morning, beloveds. So, um, there's still a hurricane coming and it's slowed down. Now, the good news is, is it's a very, uh, like if it's a, if it is still a hurricane, it's only a cat one, which is not that bad. The problem is, is it's slowed down. When hurricanes slow down, then they tend to sit on top of us and dump a lot of rain. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, we're forecast to get about six inches of rain tomorrow where we live and we're over an hour from about an hour from the coast. <sighs> hmm. Yep. That's what's going on. But we're here to learn more about what the mystics have to say. Cause you know, yesterday, yesterday was a lot. I was not expecting evolution to be, um, that much. Um, and oh no, we'll finish it today. Okay, never mind. We'll finish it today, provided this is a, a lot. Okay, so we are in chapter 20. We are starting on 341. We are starting with Cosmic Consciousness Illumination. Dr. Buck defines Cosmic Consciousness as one's consciousness of their unity with the whole. The mystic intuitively perceives truth and often without any process of reasoning immediately is aware of what Swedenborg called a sort of interior awareness, a spiritual yeah. sense. Their canon does descend into our minds, embody and personify in our persons a divinity, a unity, the spirit of God the direct incarnation of the original thing in us, the mystical presentation of Christ. Dean Ng, that's I-N-G-E, perhaps the best thinker in the Anglican church of today, tells us the Platonists had seven distinct periods of cosmic consciousness, in which state he was so completely unified with the universe that he became one with it. His spiritual philosophy was a result of these experiences. Platonus, if you want to look it up, it's P-L-O-T-I-N-U-S. He's a Greek, philosoph Greek philosopher, I think. Um, okay, Platonus, you will recall, was one of the greatest of the Neoplatonic philosophers. So yeah, he's Greek. <laughs> Dr. Buck, again, B-U-C-K-E, if you want to look him up, the author of that most notorious book, Cosmic Consciousness, which I just recently bought, by the way. Um, the print is really small, though, so I'm like, I might need a magnifying glass to read this. Okay, let me get back to the reading. Dr. Buck, the, the author of the, mo the that most rational book, Cosmic Consciousness, cites many instances of known and authentic records of people who have had definite cosmic experiences. In his scientific approach to this subject, he calls attention to the necessity of distinguishing between psychic revelation and cosmic consciousness. Reports of the experience of most psychics are contradictory. While on the other hand, the experience of those who have entered into cosmic consciousness over a period of thousands of years tell us an identical story once we get the key to their language. And that's super important that one of, one of the biggest problems of the mystical experience is our language is not sufficient to describe it. So a lot of the times mystics come back from this mystic experience and they're trying to tell people who have not had a mystic experience about it and they sound crazy. Straight up, they sound crazy because our language does not, it, it, it's not expansive enough, you know? It, it doesn't have the depth and the breadth to explain the mystic experience, which is why a lot of mystic experience, people who've had mystic experiences turn to the arts. They turn to music. They turn to poetry. They turn to uh, metaphors, as <laughs> Jesse likes to remind us. Um, they turn to painting, you know, to, ex to, to explain their experience. And it still only scratches the surface. So he's not, he's not kidding when we, that we need the key to their language. All tell the same story of reality. Um, 
one of the another way that you can kind of look into this is look at the near death experiences, uh, because again, most of them are telling the same story. Okay, um, the psychic may or may not be true. The spiritual always is, is always true. The psychic realm is the realm of the subconscious uh, or relative first cause. And remember, he talks about to, if we want to get into the cosmic, we you know the spiritual, we have to get out of the relative and into the absolute. So, so he's not, he's saying psychics are real. They're just not dealing in the absolute. They're dealing in the relative. All right. The uh, spiritual, the spiritual is the realm of first cause. Okay. <laughs> now see, here's the problem with narration. Like I'm reading this to you. So he says the, the psychic may or may not be true. Um, the spiritual always, it, the psychic realm is the realm of the subconscious or the relative first cause. Now, when he says that, they're all in lower case. Okay. When he says the spiritual is the realm of first cause, First cause is um, uppercase. So he's making a distinction there. And again, he, earlier he used the term relative versus absolute. So the spiritual is the realm of first cause, absolute, absolute first cause. Okay. Therefore, we may read Buddhist, we may read Buddha, Jesus, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Swedenborg, Emerson, Whitman, Browning, or any of the other great mystics, no matter what age they have lived, and we shall find the same ultimate. He just listed a lot of men, okay? So I'm going to remind you that Teresa of Avalon, um, I've heard of a new one called uh, Hypatia. She was um, towards the fall of Alexandria, um, a, a, a very well-known Greek philosopher, Sophoc um not Sophocles, uh, Sappho, Sappho, that's the one I want, Sappho, um, Emma Wheeler Wilcox, uh, there's another one, and I can't think of her name right now, so, you know, there, if, if you're looking for the feminine mystic, they're out there, just look for them, okay, back up, uh, no matter in what age they have lived, and we shall find the ultimate. By reading the writing of most psychics, we enter confusion. Therefore, we must understand clearly this vital difference between psychism and mysticism. One may or may not be true. The other is always true. And I would agree with him. I've met plenty of psychics. They definitely deal in the relative. And I, and I believe them, you know, but, you know, I'm not going to go to a psychic for spiritual advice. <laughs> Other advice, yeah, but not spiritual advice. So, the intelligence in an animal which directs its actions and tells it where to go to find food and shelter, we call instinct. It is really om omniscience in the animal. The same quality, more highly developed, makes a conscious appearance in people and is what we call intuition. Intuition is God in people revealing to them the realities of being. And just as instinct guides the animal, so would intuition guide people if they would allow it to do so. Here again, we must be careful and not careful not to mistake a psychic impression for an intuitive one. Psychic impressions may control Intuition remains in the background and waits for recognition. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I don't know what to do with that sentence. Not the Bible quote. Psychic impressions may control. Intuition remains in the background and awaits recognition. Yeah. Okay, whatever, Ernest. All arbitrary control of people must have stopped as soon as they came to a point of self-knowingness. From this point, they must discover themselves. But intuition, which is nothing less than God in people, silently awaits their recognition and cooperation. The Spirit is always with us, if we would but sense its presence. 
mystics have felt this wonderful power working from within and have responded to it and as certain evidence that they were not laboring under delusion. They have all sensed the same thing. Had the impressions been psychic, only each would have seen and sensed a different thing. For each would merely have been seeing through the darkness of their own subjective mentality. I just read, um, I follow Jim Palmer on Facebook and I just read, he, he talked about the, the, the parable of the six blind men exploring an elephant. I, that's what it sounds like with the psychic is, you know, the psychic is touching one part, whereas the mystics tend to kind of get an influx, influx of the whole. So, all right. Cosmic consciousness is not a mystery. It is, it is the self knowingness of God through people. The more complete the operation of that power, the more complete is people's consciousness, conscious mentality. For the illumined does not become less, but more themselves. The greater the consciousness of God, the more complete must be the realization of the true self, the divine reality. Illumination will come as people more and more realize their unity with the whole. And as they constantly endeavor to let the truth operate through them. But since the whole is at the point of inner, of the inner mentality, it will be here alone. It will be here alone that they will contact it. Speak to God, thou, for God hears. Like, he throws in these random Bible quotes to make his point, and then you're like, wait, what? <laughs> At least I think that was a Bible quote. Honestly, I'm not sure. Ernest doesn't cite his sources. It's one of the crazy-making things. There is a book, though, um, not that I can ever remember the name of it, where somebody sat down, or several somebody sat down, went through the Science of Mind text, and cited all of the sources, at least the Bible sources, that they could. So there's a book to cite his sources. All right. Eh, back to. All right. Always in such degree as one has spiritual sense, they realize universality in their own soul. The great mystics have had that sense and have felt the possibility of an immediate communion with the universal spirit. This essence has run through all theologies and has been the cause of much of their vitality. Theology, with all its weakness, has been stronger in its strength than it has been weak in its weakness, because the vital elements of it have been greater than the devitalizing ones. It would not have lived unless this were true. The only God people know is the God of their own inner life. They can know no other, which is what we call the God of your understanding. Okay. To assume that people can know a God outside of themselves is to assume that they can know something of which they cannot be conscious. This does not mean that, that people are God. It means that the only God that people know is within and that the only life people have is from within. God is not external, but indwelling at the very center of people's life. This is what God, what Jesus said. This is why Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within and why he prayed. Okay. Again, he's using a Bible quote kind of oddly here. Um, Our Father, which art in heaven. I think he's you trying to use the Bible quote to make his point. Ernest, you make me crazy. Back to Ernest. Currently making me crazy. <laughs> um, the great mystics like Jesus have taught that we were, that as we enter into the one, the one enters into us and becomes us, and is us. They have taught the mystical marriage, the union of the soul of P 
people with the soul of God and the unity of all life. The great mystics, while sensing this unity, the universality of all things, have also seen, sensed the individualization of being and the individuality of people as a divine reality. Uh, Tagor, T-A-G-O-R-E, if you want to look it up, in, speak, in seeking to explain this, says that the individual is immersed in, but not lost in nirvana. And he uses the illustration, as an arrow is, lo is lost in its mark, still remaining an arrow. The mysticism of Buddha did not teach the annihil annihilation of the soul, but the internality of an ever-expanding principle of the soul. The highest mental practice to listen is to listen to this inner voice and to declare its presence. The greater a person's consciousness of this indwelling I am, the more fully they will live. This will never lead to illusion, but will always lead to reality, with a capital R, by the way. All great souls have known this and have constantly striven to let the mind of God expressed through their mentalities. The spirit that dwelleth in me, it doth the work. This was the declaration of the great master, and it should be ours also. Not a limited sense of life, but a limitless one. It is impossible to put into words or into print what a mystic sometimes sees. I made that point earlier, right? Uh, and it is, it is as difficult to believe to realize that it is so, as it is to put it into words. But there is a certain inner sense which, at times, sees reality in a flash which illuminates the whole being with a great flood of light. This, too, might seem an illusion unless the testimony were complete. But every mystic has had this experience. Some in a greater degree than others. Jesus was the greatest of all the mystics. And once, at least, after a period of illumination, his face was so bright that his followers could not look upon it. All mystics have seen this cosmic light. It is why it is said they were illumined. They have all had the same experience. Whether it was Moses coming down from the mountain, Jesus after the resurrection, Saul on their return to on his return to Damascus, Emerson walking across the common in Concord, where suddenly he became conscious of this light, or Whitman, who refers to it as that which stuck its forked tongue into his being as he lay on the grass, or whether it was Edward Carpenter who, after leaving Whitman, looking up thought all of New York City was in flames. This light the great artists have sent so completely that they have depicted it as a halo around the heads of saints, an atmosphere of light. Okay, I'm going to remind you here, because he, obviously, this was written well before, because, you know, 1927, I think, in 1969, when he was, they call it the Sermon by the Sea, you can Google it. Actually, if you just go back to last Sunday, um, it's one of the links Danielle put in. There's you can you can listen to Ernest himself have that mystical experience. He's do he's there for a church dedication. He's doing his speech, and it you know at first they were afraid he was having a stroke, um, but it is one of the most. You want to listen to somebody have a mystical experience right there in front of you. Try go look that up, Ernest Holmes. <laughs> if you want to Google it, it's um, it's the dedication of the Whittier Church. They also call it the Sermon by the Sea, and there are at least two or three YouTube videos. Um, obviously, it's not a video; it's an audio. Um, but you can go listen to it where he has his mystical experience. It's phenomenal. Okay, back to the reading. Buck points out that the illumination of all mystics has been accompli accompanied by a great light. 
He feels that Emerson walked on the verge of the light, this light for many years and more continuously than most people, but did not, did not have quite a definite, as definite an experience of its fullness as some others but that he had what we might term a greater continuation of what we shall call a lesser light. It is interesting that light should come with an explanation of consciousness. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not. We all, in varying degrees, enter into this sense, into this illumination. All people have sensed that truth is light. If a spiritual treatment could be seen, and a spiritual treatment merely means the mind unifying with good, it would be seen as a pathway of light. Huh. Now that's an interesting idea that I have not considered before. Okay. I'm going to think about that next time I do a treatment. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um... This light is not created. It is not a psychological explosion. It is something which pre-exists. It is useless to try and visualize it or to make it appear. It is not a trick of concentration. The kingdom of heaven cometh not by observation. In moments of deepest realization, the great mystics have sensed that one life flows through all and that all are some part of that life. They have also seen substance, a fine, white, brilliant stuff, forever falling into something, or falling into everything, excuse me. A substance indestructible and eternal. If it, it is at all times of complete realization that they have been blinded by the light of which we have been speaking. Remember, all of this takes place in a perfectly normal state of mind and has nothing whatsoever to do with psych the psychic state. It is not an illusion, but a reality. And it is during these periods that real revelations come. Perhaps a good illustration would be to suppose a large group of people in a room together, but unaware of each other's presence. Each is busy with their own personal affairs. Suddenly, the room is illumined for a second, and they all see each other. Afterwards, they try to tell what they saw. In flashes of illumination, the inspired have seen into the very center of reality and have brought back with them a picture of what they saw and felt briefly. These have been their conclusions. They have been firmly convinced of immortality, immortality now, not to be achieved at some future day. Individuality, God as personal to the individual, the inevitable overcoming of all evil by good. Therefore, they have taught that in such a such degree as one's concept of God is sufficient, evil disappears. How are we going to make this practical? other than feeling this in our meditation for practical work, for healing, for demonstration. This is what we mean by a method, a procedure, a technique, and a realization. That accompanying the method and the technique should always come as much of the realization as we can generate at the time. In the method and the technique, something is said. This is a moving thing. But when we reach that other place, illumination, nothing is said. Something is felt. And that's how he ends the chapter. <laughs> illumination. Nothing is said. Something is felt. Thought wrapped in feeling, people. Thought wrapped in feeling. All right. We are finished with the mystics. Maybe. <laughs> so we will start tomorrow on chapter 21, some phases of the subjective life. I've got to start keeping a highlighter in here because I'm going to go back and highlight that little bit about the pathway of light because 
I've never caught that before. So like, I'm super excited about that. All right. But again, chapter 21, we'll start chapter 21 tomorrow. Um, tomorrow is Monday. I intend to be here. We'll see if Burl, that's the hurricane, has anything to say about that. So if I'm not on, it means that the weather was too awful and I couldn't. Um, and then we'll pick it up on Tuesday. So, you know, don't worry about it. Um, but we'll start on uh, 347 with some faces of the subjective life. All right. Uh, and the good news is, is I did eat breakfast before uh, because it's 10 o'clock and now I need to go pack up and get ready to head to the center. Uh, so just brief housekeeping. Creative Life Spiritual Center, Creative Life Spark. I'm the running Rev Ryan on the social medias that I'm on. An easy way that you can support the center is to engage with our social media. Um, go like, subscribe, share, follow, comment, do all the things. Uh, and if on the Sunday services, we try and put in interesting links, in, links, including the link to that Ernest's own mystical experience. So please, um, do that. It, and it was out of his mystical experience that the Aladdin's lamp, the celestial, I think the book is called Aladdin's lamp and then the celestial voices in that, or maybe I'm getting two books conflated, which is extremely possible. He wrote a lot of books. Um, so yeah, please engage with our social media. Uh, the website is creativelife.org. The constant contact is, is email info at creativelife.org. You get one email a week unless something happens, um, i.e. like if we don't have power at the center and need to close it. So, you know, there's that. Not that this hurricane's, <laughs> trust me, we're not really worried about the hurricane. So concerned, as always, as rational human beings should be, but not worried about it. Um, and then uh, the hot links are hot in the email. So I'm going to encourage you to have a great day, a wondrous day, a fantastic day, a magical day, an enchanted day, a wonderful day, an awesome day, an amazing day. And suddenly I am out of adjectives. So after amazing day, I usually, okay, let's have a get some stuff done day, a prepare for the weather day, a drink plenty of water day, a get comfortable day, a call a friend day, a cuddle your fur babies day, a take care of some business day, a rest day, a take a nap day, a good day. And if that is too much pressure, simply have a day. You are enough just as you are. You are a beloved expression of the divine. You are a brilliant light, a divine spark, your spirit in motion, you are God in action, or as Reverend Jesse likes to call us, you are a godling. All right. Explore the truth of your being. That's kind of what I'm, I'm doing here, reading the signs of mine. I'm exploring the truth to, of my being and hopefully taking y'all along on the journey. Uh, I do. Um, I do want to remind you one thing. It's it's a promise and it's the only promise I can make you. The person that the divine knows you to be is good. OK, the person God knows you to be is good. And from there, all things are possible. All right. Okay. So Reverend David should be on around 5 p.m. with you. Barring the weather, I'll be back with you around 9 a.m. tomorrow. Um, and, uh, but we will have an amazing service for you in just about an hour right here on Facebook live. Unless you're watching this on the, on, uh, if you're watching this later, scroll up a video. If you're watching this on YouTube, well, go to the creative life. <laughs> Creative Life Spiritual Center YouTube channel, and then you can watch the Sunday service. He's starting a new uh, series focused on, I believe it's Thoreau. That's where he's taking his inspiration from this month. So it should be really interesting. I mean, last month he took his inspiration from a water graphic. He's just, Jesse's really cool in that way. All right. Take care of yourself. Know that you are loved. And I will see you next time.